It's time to talk sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. A panorama of the world of sports. Stories, comments, and opinions. Touchdown, Now, here's iconic sports talk show host Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and co-host John Riley. Who wants to talk sports on a Monday? We do. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Our studio's in San Diego about with my co-host, John Riley, who's not outside where it's 101 degrees in left field. He's in studio with us. We welcome you to our bonus podcast. Tremendous amount of topics on the table. John, good afternoon. Hope you're staying cool. This is brutal. But boy, have we got some things to talk about on our bonus package. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hot outside. <laughs> It's hot in the world of sports. We're, like, frustrated as Padre fans. Plus, there's a ton more going on. This is going to be a great episode. Okay, we're going to set the table here very briefly. At the end of our Hacksaw Headline podcast, we do what is called Fans Forum. It's your chance to interact with us. You jump on board. You ask a question. You make a comment. And we will fire back at you. John, explain how they join us on Fans Forum. Yeah, so all you got to do is check out the live live stream chat on Facebook or YouTube. And there you can just drop in your question. Just type it in on Facebook or YouTube on the live stream. We'll see it on our screen. We'll get you involved in the fans forum segment at the conclusion of Hacksaw's headlines. I want you to know that we've been doing this about eight months. We have 2,200 subscribers to our YouTube channel. And John dragged me kicking and screaming (laughs) into Instagram and TikTok and threads and all that. We have over 8,000 thousand followers in about nine weeks just on instagram alone so if you're new to what we're doing we ask you to subscribe we ask you to share we ask you to tell everybody you know what we do with the bonus package on monday what we do with the regular thursday podcast and by the way check my website. That's the address right up top, LeeHacksawHamilton.com. If you like sports, I guarantee you will like what I write every day, every night on the internet. John, off and running. Let's talk about your baseball team in left field. Uh, This was a brutal weekend in Philadelphia, Lee. I don't know if the Padres are going to recover. Uh, Padres must win road trip has turned into a lost weekend, John. Uh, now they're, they're going into Toronto, then they go to Detroit, then they come home, but they play big boys when they get home, including first place Texas, Baltimore, which is on the brink of being in first place, and the Dodgers. Padres are just not playing well. It's not a complete team anymore. As the headline says, they are 10 games out of first place. They are now seven back of the last wild card position, and the clock continues to tick. I guess the burning question, is Bob Melvin in trouble as manager? You know, I think there's huge questions about the handling, or is it the mishandling of the pitching staff? I'll give you a couple of prime examples, and I don't like to nitpick But here you got Blake Snell just on a blazing hot stretch, and you pull him after five innings. Blake Snell, eyes open and said, I wasn't toasted or roasted. Give me the ball. Let me go out another inning. Uh, You got Joe Musgrove. Musgrove has been phenomenal, 7-0 in his last nine starts, ERA of about 1.58. He goes eight days between starts. And there's a huge question about when are you using Josh Hader? Why can't you use him back-to-back? Of course, the middle of the bullpen has been a disaster. So I just think there's managerial questions that have to be asked about Ruben Ayabla, the pitching coach, who supposedly got great credentials, and Bob Melvin, the decision maker, as to who you're using, when you're using them, and why you're doing certain things when, obviously, segments of the pitching staff are leaking oil right now. And I thought about this last night, and I got really upset. And I'm a journalist. I'm not supposed to get (laughs) upset about the team in town. They're 0-9 in extra inning games, John. 0-9 with a $253 million payroll. And they quote, fab four at the top of the batting order. Now, last I checked, when you go to the 10th or the 11th or the 12th inning, there's a ghost runner at second base. You mean with this batting order, which is potentially dangerous most every inning, with a runner out there that would be the go-ahead run? You can't win an extra inning game? That just blew my mind. I'm going to have to go back and do some research to figure out what their team batting order is in extra innings. But they're 0-9 with that batting order and with ghost runners starting at second base. That just driving me crazy. So we're pushing. We're pushing to August 1st and the trade deadline. Do you keep the Fab Four together? 
Would you get tremendous value if you traded Juan Soto? Could you make a haul if you moved Blake Snell? I mean, hell, if you're 12 games out of first place or 15 out of first place going to the trade deadline, do you keep it together or do you make changes? And then the other question, if you think you can still hang in there and you make a deal to go get somebody else, are you willing to trade top minor leaguers, the Preller model? Are you willing to trade Jackson Morrell, the shortstop? Are you willing to trade maybe their top minor league pitcher down at Class A, Rob Snelling, to go get an established guy? Looking for another bat? Now, please tell me. Do you think Tommy Pham or Will Myers, both available, would make a difference trying to save your season? And do you really think getting Robert Suarez back and Luis Camposano back off the I.L. within this week is going to save your season? So, John... You tell me where they are. Is the manager in trouble? Why the hell can't they win extra inning games with a ghost runner at second base in this batting order? And what do you do to the roster? Who do you give up? What do you want to get? Stay the course. Make moves. Your turn. Okay, there's a ton there. So what what does uh, what we do about, um, yeah, about Bob Melvin? So first of all, he's got all that great experience, but he was working with the Oakland A's when they had a bunch of young guys. He wasn't managing these big egos, these big money guys. Now here's an interesting case is remember in the National League championship series, when he let Suarez pitch to Bryce Harper, rather than bringing Hader in, in the eighth, and then Harper hits the home run, the Padres lose. Well, this time Harper comes up in extra innings and the pot, or no, maybe it was the ninth inning when this happened, when they tied it up. I get that right. I think that's what happened. It was in the ninth and the first base was open and Hader was pitching and he pitched to Bryce Harper. And you're thinking, okay, this is the matchup we should have seen in the NLCS, but this is when you should have walked him, you know, because first base was open and that run doesn't mean anything. And yet you chose to pitch to one of the best players in the Major League Baseball. So there's questions like that that I wonder about Melvin. You know, you, on one hand, you think he's got all this experience, but then, you know, here we're just a bunch of dudes like in our on our couch with a beer watching the game, and and we're questioning these decisions. I don't get it. Oh, Padre Twitter. Think they're pissed off? Oh, my Holy God. Holy cow. They're going bananas. Now, what were the other two items on the table there? All right, the, you're 0-9 in extra oh, innings with a Fab Four and a Ghost Runner at second. Does that the, drive you crazy? It's awful. And besides it being 0-9 in extra innings, they're... I don't know what the number is, but it's staggering what their record is when they're behind after six or seven innings. Eight and 34. That's what it is. It's just awful. So they have no, like, will. They they don't have this drive that we want to see, except for certain players like Tatis when he came through pinch hitting in the eighth. Uh, but, you know, what do you do with the roster? Um well, first of all, Snell, they should have let him pitch longer. The bullpen's been a disaster. you got to let him go deeper. But Snell, I think, is a guy you can trade. Um, I think Soto, you're probably not going to get back what you gave up when you gave him Five to Washington. Yeah. But I think you've got to make some moves here because it's not working. And if they can essentially retool and kind of rebuild the farm system, you're going to keep your core guys, Machado, Tatis, uh, Musgrove, Darvish. They're not going anywhere. But Snell, Hayter, maybe Soto, those are guys you deal. Campusano helps you a bit. Suarez helps you a bit, but they're not going to save the season. So you would, if this thing gets away from them in this next week— as we go to August 1, you would entertain offers for Soto. Now, he, he's got a year and a half to go on his contract, mm -hmm. so it's not like somebody's renting him for 30 games. But do you think you could get a Mackenzie Gore type package yeah. back of five for one? I think you could. I mean, maybe not a five for one, but you'll get something back. See, the deal is with Soto. Is he hasn't signed an extension with the Padres. He's probably not. He's probably going to go into free agency. I mean, is Boris his agent? I mean, that's what always happens with Boris. And you look at Soto and you're saying, OK, this guy is legit. His OPS looks great. He walks a ton. The power is kind of comes and goes and he cannot play defense. His defense in left field is terrible. So now I'm thinking maybe you move him and maybe we just kind of rethink this now. You move Hater. Oh, well, Hater is a free agent at the end of the year. But why don't you offer him a contract? We know he's locked down. Mm hmm. So they haven't done that. Well, again, this is like Otani. You know, how, are, are, is the owner making a, a contract offer before the trade deadline? 
I don't know. I think they think I think Preller has Suarez penciled in as his closer of the future. And I think they, if they can get something back for Hader, they do it. But I realistically, we keep hoping and praying they're going to turn the corner and they never, ever do. Oh, this is just this is hard to accept. Oh, it's terrible. I've never seen anybody put out obscenities on Twitter like you did <laughs> on Sunday night. OK, we go from that. Okay. Let's talk about midseason baseball. This is kind of interesting. Yeah, so I mean, this is uh, Rob Manford. He's got a lot going on here with all these rules changes. I mean, how do you think he shapes up with this uh, new format? Commissioner's office just on Sunday night released a midseason report card on the rule changes. And this is kind of fascinating. And you and I kind of agreed, even though you, you were yelling at me from left field with your opinions, <laughs> that the rule changes would make a positive difference to the game. And it really have. Pitch clock. Uh, last year, games went three hours and five minutes. First half of this season to the All-Star break this year, two hours, 39 minutes. I think people really like the faster-paced game. Mm-hmm. Uh, violations. Spring training, they average like four violations per game. You know, the pitch clock, on and off the rubber, throws to first base, etc. Since opening day, one violation every two games. So virtually everybody Mm -hmm. has gotten used to it. Ban on the shift. This is a little bit different. I thought the numbers would be higher. Last year's team batting average, 242 with the shift. This year, team batting average, 248. I thought it'd be a little bit higher, but it's not, at least the first half of the season. Home runs, 2.3 more home runs this year than last year. And, of course, baseball's become about long ball. Mm -hmm. So home runs have gone up. I don't understand this stat. Stolen bases, up only 1.8 stolen bases a game this year compared to last year. And this is with how many disengagements? You can only go to the base twice? Yeah. Guys, we, we thought, well, based on what we saw the first couple of weeks of the season, guys would be running all the time, and they're not. I mean, that, that's the one number that really stood out to me, only 1.8 stolen bases upgrade per games. Runs, people likes offense. Last year, 8.4 runs per game. This year, John, 9.2 runs per game. Now, I don't know how much of that's got to do with the bad Oakland A's and Kansas City Royals pitching staffs, but the two teams combined are averaging nine runs per game. TV ratings, TBS up 41%. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball up 17%. And baseball attendance is up 8% the first half of the season and... The demographics of who's attending games, young people, teenagers into their 20s, numbers have rocketed. Yeah. So I I think all in all, the rule changes, as controversial as they may have been to the traditionalists, seem to have had a real impact in the game. And you just look statistically at what's gone on. Um, your response? Yeah, I, I like the rules changes. And in, in the beginning, I was, you know, old school curmudgeon. Uh, we don't need a pitch clock. But I like the pace of games. But they still have bugs in the system. Remember that deal with Odor last yesterday? No. And I think Soto is pitching for the Phillies. And the, the umpire screwed it up, you know. So And then they end up wasting five minutes arguing about it. So they still have some bugs and kinks to work out. But I like the uh, I like the the pitch clock. I like the banning of the shift. Although I'm shocked that the Padres haven't been able to capitalize on the banning of the shift as much. I thought guys would be driving balls through all sides of the infield because they're we're not loading the right side of second yeah, base. But I think they're still trying to hit home runs. You know, well, and that's how they get paid is when they hit the home run. And so there's still some things I think this goes to Bowman and a lot of other managers is they need to shift their strategy. You know, they need to be thinking like Whitey Herzog in the 80s, you know, looking for speed on the bases, punching that ball through because you don't need to mash it over a shifted right side and try to hit it over right field wall. Yeah, I, I just get the sense that they're hanging around waiting for somebody to pop one, mm-hmm. knock one out, and that hurts them. They don't have, I don't think they've got a lot of team speed on that roster. And I think maybe that's why they're not running very much, but you got to build towards some of that. One one other comment you made about the demographics. This is very evident at Petco, is that there's a lot of young people. It's like a party city when you're there on Fridays and Saturdays. And the families too, but I think it's just becoming 
cooler for young people to go to the ballpark, um, especially with all the entertainment amenities and the food and the kind of the, um, yeah, sort of the gourmet food and all the different options, beer gardens and things. It's become a neat place. And these new ballparks in Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and everywhere else really attract a lot of young folks. There's no doubt Petco is really a destination point for entertainment. Oh, by the way, there's a ball game going on, but there's just a cool aura. And you know, we watch Padre telecast and you just see the young families and all the kids and wearing the gear and just having a good time. And by the way, we hope the team wins. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think Petco has really become a destination point for entertainment in downtown San Diego. OK, that's baseball. You got a response. You're watching us on our live stream. Fire us a comment on fans forum so we'll get to it right at the end your opinion counts. Ask a question. We will give you an answer, agree or disagree. <laughs> Too bad for you. All right, let's talk college football because this story has not been solved yet. It's not going away either. No, I mean, the, the San Diego State Aztecs are still in this limbo. But are they going to resolve it this week? Uh, presidents of the other 11 schools in the Mountain West Conference Zoom call on Monday afternoon. Maybe we get an understanding on Tuesday as to what they have decided about San Diego State's status in the Mountain West Conference. There's nothing been resolved across the street yet with the Pac-12, their new media deal, or whether or not there's going to be an offer made. But the Pac-12 media day is the is Friday the 21st. We're led to believe, at least the people that I network with, that they may simultaneously announce, this is the TV contract we've got. And then after that will come... Whatever offers for expansion are going to come. Mountain West presidents were meeting. I'm led to believe the topics that they are discussing on the Zoom call in Colorado Springs on this Monday afternoon as we talk. Expel San Diego State from the conference immediately. You owe us $17 million. Those are the bylaws as it relates to schools exiting the conference. Another one would be extend the window for them to make a final decision and create an installment payment plan if a year from now they wish to exit because the timing might be better. But are the presidents allowed to do that or do I have to change the bylaws of the conference? I can't, couldn't get to a lawyer to give me an uh, explanation. Third one was you violated the exit clause. We're fining you a million dollars. You can play next year, but you're dead meat. You owe us a million dollars on top of the $17 million exit fee. So that's that's where we are right now. It's messy. Uh, this should have never gotten to this. The president, De La Torre, was wrong for how she approached it. I don't understand the Mountain West screwing these guys. This has been the flagship university that's really kept the credibility of the conference afloat. And you're doing this to them. I do understand the Mountain West is going to have a crisis on its hands if it loses San Diego State. But that's business. You can't keep them from improving themselves. I understand they're going to have to go back and restructure their TV contract with CBS and with Fox. And that might mean lesser money for Wyoming and Colorado State, et cetera. But that, that's the business we're in in college athletics right now. I I don't understand why you just can't sit there and say, we'll grant you an extension, we'll grant you another year extension, and we'll work out an installment plan. And if you wish to leave a year from now, you can. Why do they have to bury them at this point in time? And that seems to be the sentiment there. So that that's the capsule summary I have from the people that I network with in Colorado and some people in the Pacific Northwest that are really kind of locked into this whole thing. Your response? Well, it's kind of like when you have to break up with a girlfriend. It's like, do you want to be the one doing the breakup or do you want to be on the receiving end of that? I think it's clear that the other presidents can see the writing on the wall, that if it's not now, in the next few years, San Diego State is going to exit. And so maybe they want to take, you know, the the, sort of the proactive position. And to your point, maybe boot them um, and then, you know, let them kind of suffer because they they got abandoned 10 years ago when they went to the Big East and then they had to come back with their tail between their legs. So they might use leverage here, especially if they have a contract and, you know, the contract is the contract. But I don't know. Yeah, you're right. San Diego State put themselves in a terrible position. And I don't know if they really have any other options at this point. Okay, we go from that story to an unbelievable scandal. Do you know do you know what the letters S.E.C. in college football stand for? 
Southeast Conference? Sure, everybody cheats. <laughs> How about this story at the University of Tennessee? NCAA drops the hammer on the Volunteers football program. 200 recruiting violations under the reign of their former head coach since fired and now demonized Jeremy Pruitt. 18 major violations. When they got done, when I got done reading this two-page press release, the sanctions, I said, I hope there's something else to do in the fall in Knoxville because you're not going to win any football games. Now, I thought historically the treatment of Southern Cal's football program and the Pete Carroll era, the Reggie Bush crisis, that was pretty bloody harsh. That was 40 scholarships that they were mm-hmm. taken away. They killed Tennessee. So you got 200 violations. A large chunk of it's got to do with payment of money to families of kids who they recruited who signed, taking care of mother and father, money under the table from the big cigars, the boosters. Wow. They nailed them. So they suspend Jeremy Pruitt, the former head coach, for six years. Can't coach anywhere. He'll be selling you encyclopedias at 5 o'clock tonight. (laughs) Five years probation. So if there's any other violation there, they're going back down the rabbit hole. It's going to be really bad. Stripped them of 28 scholarships Whoa. over a four-year window. That's seven per year. That's kind of damaging. Yeah. Stripped them of 38 paid recruiting visits. Bobby Blue Chip wants to come visit Knoxville. Well, now you're losing on the average of nine recruiting visits per year. 38 total recruiting visits, paid recruiting visits. Banned them. 40 other on-campus visits. You want to take your son, might be the backup quarterback, to visit the University of Tennessee. You're paying your way in. But they stripped 40 of those recruiting visits from the University of Tennessee. Ban on 28 weeks of communication with recruits. No phone calls. Jeez. No emails. No texts. Dropping the hammer. Oh, big time drop of the hammer. And by the way, they fined them $9 million dollars. The university. Oh, my God. Now, they did, didn't ban him from a bowl game, but the reality is Josh Hoople's the head coach, former star co- quarterback at Oklahoma, nice guy, done a good job. He's not going to a bowl game, so there's no reason to ban him. You can't lose that many scholarships, that many recruiting visits for Bobby Blue Chip, that many random recruiting visits in which the family pays to go, and, and to go seven weeks per year over a four-year span, 28-week total ban on communicating with recruits, that's wow. devastating stuff. So they didn't kill them, but they're going to be down for a while. Why didn't they just restructure it in the form of an NIL so that they could still, you know, the boosters could still funnel the money to the players, but stay within the, you know, within the paradigm of what's acceptable? Taking scholarships away means less talent. And, you, well, I mean, the boosters will still pay whatever the NIL is going to look like over the next four years. They can pay what they want, but you got less players, less Bobby Blue Chip players to come in. Well, yeah, now they do. To but, wear orange. But they, they didn't have to put themselves in this position if they had, you know, channeled the money the same way, the right way. Because now we all know there's money, there's recruiting money going on, but now it's sort of above board with NIL deals as opposed to, like you say, cigars and behind the curtain with the boosters. Well, as all it used this to Jeremy be. Pruitt stuff happened before the NIL ever came ah, into existence. Okay, then that's the difference. This goes back four to five to six years, but that's pretty significant stuff. I wonder what Peyton Manning is thinking about all this. Oh, my alma mater. <laughs> All right, before we get to the next topic on the table, John, let's just remind everybody about Fans Forum again. Let's remind everybody of how they can share and subscribe and get access to all the stuff that we present on our bonus coverage on Monday and what we do on Thursdays. Yeah, I see a lot of guys here already in the um, in the live chat. Tim, SG Sports Talk Channel, Caesar is in here, Tom, and Emmanuel. So load up the Fans Forum. We'll get you involved. Just type in your question or comment on the live chat on Facebook or YouTube. Be sure to subscribe wherever 
wherever you get your podcasts, including on Apple Podcasts, on YouTube. We're on all the popular uh, social media platforms. So make sure you like, follow, share, and subscribe. And yeah, Threads is kind of a neat little thing that's been growing for us in the last week. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg will be contacting you soon, I'm sure. <laughs> I also want to remind you, if you like sports, check my website. You know, I've, I've got like 9,400 followers now on Twitter. But they're not checking my website. I write on it every day of the week. Tons of different information. Uh, best 15 minutes in sports, Hacksaw's headlines, one man's opinion column, Hacksaw's mini polls. So check my website. You do it every day. By the way, I need hits. So make sure you check it, <laughs> LeeHacksawHamilton.com. And by the way, uh, tell all your friends about what we're doing creatively, a multimedia man here, and give us a thumbs up if you can. And we don't have any pride. Rate us. We'll take five stars. Go, go. I appreciate that, too, along the way. On we go. Oh, this is not bad. This is bad in Phoenix, and I'm just not talking about bad weather. Yeah, I know. I saw the headline on this, oh. and this is ugly, really ugly. Alex Galchenyuk uh, is a goal scorer, played with the Colorado Avalanche last year, just signed a free agent contract with the Arizona Coyotes. He got arrested, arrested over the weekend. Confrontation. It was a hit-and-run incident in which he destroyed private property, did not injure anybody. I don't know whether he was drunk or not, but if you connect the dots, this kind of seems to be this way. Then, as he was being questioned, he got involved in a confrontation with the police in Scottsdale. This is really (laughs) ugly stuff. Tried to get in his vehicle and leave the scene of the accident. Resisted arrests, punches thrown had to be obviously restrained and then handcuffed. And in the middle of all that, he threatened them. I know people in Russia. I will call Moscow. You will be dead. Your wife and your children will be dead. This guy must have been on a horrific binge. The Arizona Coyotes, who had just signed him two weeks ago, released him within hours of this information become public. What a what a bad dude! What a troubled soul! This is the, one of the more stupid things that we've had to talk about. But his career is effectively over. Maybe he can go back and fight on the Russian front for Putin. I'm oh. going to call Moscow. Jeez, <laughs> it's like a James Bond movie or something, <laughs> you know, with a villain. But you know, it, it's tough. I mean, first of all, obviously, it must be alcohol related, and the guy's out of his mind. But you know, lo- there are cases when people get pulled over by the cops, and the cops are, you know, being a holes, you know, through the process. But you just can't push back. I mean, you're just going to lose no matter what you do. You just have to kind of take it. But you know, maybe he's. Not used to the American culture. You know, maybe there is a, an issue here with alcohol that made him make these stupid choices. But gee whiz, good for the um, coyotes for just jettisoning the guy. I'm going to call Moscow. I could not believe that quote at all. It's right there in the police report. <laughs> On we go. Did you enjoy this? I really enjoyed this. I must tell you, I got hooked on Wimbledon back in the 80s. I mean, I, I grew up in New York. We have, we, obviously, Arthur Ashe was a really special human being. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. Tennis Center there in Flushing Meadows, just a cool place. U.S. Open, as great an event as there is, not equal to what goes on at, at the All England Lawn and Tennis Club. But I got hooked in the 80s, and, and I loved watching McEnroe. And then, obviously, that became Borg versus Connors. Mm-hmm. And then we had Boris Becker. And then we fast-forwarded. Pete Sampras had such a great career for maybe a decade. And Jim Courier showed up and was so much fun to watch. And then then we got Agassi. And then we got the modern-day superstars, Nadal and Federer, and now Novak Djokovic. What a phenomenal men's final at Wimbledon on Sunday. Carlos Alcaraz, who was down 1-6, lost the first set 1-6, came back and won three of the next four and put Jokovic away. And who is Jokovic? This is the guy from Serbia, independent thinker, Mm -hmm. wise guy, tough guy, opinionated guy. I am not getting vaccinated guy. Mm -hmm. Was ordered, expelled from the U.S. last year, was not allowed to play in the U.S. Open because he did not have the vaccine. And you look at his career, he had won five Wimbledons in a row, He was going for his eighth cup overall in London. Guy has been to the finals 
32 times of Grand Slam events. 32 wow. Grand Slam finals had won 23 of them. He was about to break Federer's record and Nadal's record of all-time greatest wins. And he gets knocked out. And Alcaraz just, you talk about playing on the edge and playing with emotion and playing with heart. It was a battle of attrition. He wore the superstar Jokovic down. I mean, it was phenomenal. Half the people in the seats, and I, I email back and forth with a journalist from London who's there. He said, it's amazing. When Jokovic would serve, the Yoko fans would go crazy. And when Alcaraz would make a shot, they'd blow the roof off the stadium. I mean, it was so... So really electric. And they had one game, John. And I know you were pissing and moaning about the Padres while I was watching (laughs) tennis. They had one game in the second set. One game, 27 minutes. Wow. 32 points. They played the deuce 13 times. And six times they played break points. And these guys kept going back and forth and exchanging and beating the other guy on a shot. I mean, it was slam and smash, and it was come to net, and it was overhand shots, and it was dropping balls into the corner. I mean, it was phenomenal to watch. And, you know, Wimbledon is its just one of the most unique events. I mean, the Masters is really unique. There's no doubt about it globally. This is the equal to that. And now we have a changing of the guard. 20-year-old Spaniard wins his second Grand Slam in about a year and a half. It, it was a really cool thing to see. Yeah, I, I caught the last part of it, um, you know, and I think the rain delay with the Padres kind of opened up space for us to watch tennis. So, yeah, what an exciting event. And I'll tell you, like, like you, I, I watched tennis very closely in the 70s and the early 80s because we had a, so many great American stars. Yep. And I, it was a really premier sport at the time. And then as we've had more international stars, I've kind of lost touch with the sport but love seeing the young kid come up and did you see his um, acceptance speech afterwards yep. and he was kind of praising Jokovic but sort of backhand complimenting mm-hmm. without realizing because he was so much older than him I grew up watching you when I was a little kid so uh, it's a great event and I, I'll tell you this my my wife when she was um, in college she went to Europe one summer and she got tickets to go to Wimbledon and she saw like a women's doubles match and she told me that it's amazing how small that arena is. I mean, it looks decent size on TV, and certainly it's no baseball, football stadium, obviously. But on TV, it still looks pretty big. But in real life, it's very, very intimate. Yeah, and the seats are built, so you get great sight lines. Yeah. And, I mean, how cool is it? Not only are all the tennis superstars there in retirement, you know, McEnroe's on the broadcast and Jimmy Connors is sitting in the seats, then you have the Royal Box, which was absolutely phenomenal. And Chrissy Everett was in the Royal Box with the Princess of Wales. Nice. I mean, it is just really, really cool. So changing of the guard, I think for the most part, is now complete. This is not to say that Jokovic is done, because I still think at age 36 or 38, he's still got the fire in his gut. But here comes this young gun, and this guy was gunning. It was, it was pretty impressive. Okay, so we go from London there. <laughs> Now we go to what's called Hoy Lake, England. Here we go. Yeah, the British Open, another big uh, one of the big uh, Grand Slams, right? Yeah, they they go off Thursday, uh, first couple days this week. Uh, practice rounds at Royal Liverpool, very tough course. I think the most unique things about the Open is not only just the magnificent of the history that goes back to the mid eighteen hundreds, and not only the the wildness and the beauty and the toughness of the links courses. Then you got the weather. What's the weather going to be like blowing in off the Irish Sea? (laughs) It might be different at 8 a.m. for those who tee off early, and damn, it's going to be different at 1.30 in the afternoon. It is such a great event coming on the heels of Wimbledon. So not only do we have the burning questions, Rory McIlroy, here come the guys from the LIV, get the chance to play. We've got all the, quote, unfinished business, and that guy has stood up and made some statements. We're talking about Xander Shuffley, the ex-Aztec, who's right on the brink of becoming a superstar. He's gotten to this level where he's he's played a bunch of final Sundays. He's been at the top of the leaderboard and faltered off. He's been at the, the middle of the pack and climbed back up. Hasn't won a, a Grand Slam, but he's, he's played well in certain flashes. But he goes public on Saturday, and he says, we want answers. We the players, the aftermath of PGA 
L-I-V. He says, Jay Monahan has lost our trust. He says, we need questions answered from the commissioner right now. Xander asked, how could you bypass the players in terms of the data that was being negotiated? He says, the players want a vote in this decision. Now, this comes on the heels of the congressional hearings where the senator from Connecticut, Richard Rosenthal, just demonstrably stood up and told the PGA, this is wrong to take blood money. This is wrong to try to make Saudi Arabia look like a different country when we all know what Saudi Arabia is. And Xander said uh, the commissioner had emailed every player on the tour a 275-page document which listed the background of the talks and what was proposed and what they think they should be working on. And he said, too little, too late. This information should have been provided way before any announcement was made about a, quote, merger. And then Xander wrapped it up, and he just left this question hanging out there that Jay Monahan is going to have to answer. Have you forgotten what Saudi Arabia represents? Mm. So we got all that wrapped around, teeing off at Royal Liverpool in Hoylake, England on Thursday. Your response? It's interesting because, you know, obviously the PGA guys, they just want to run a tournament, right? But at the same time, it's legit uh, for Xander to demand these answers. I mean, have you ever worked for a large company that seemed to be drifting? The leadership wasn't there and the people in the company were like, what's going on? How come we're not (laughs) hearing anything from the president of our company? We don't know the future. And it creates a great unsettling uneasiness. So, yeah, the PGA guys have got to step up and be bold. It seems like they're reacting, you know, to getting, you know, bullets shot at them by Congress or the media kind of raking them over the coals with this deal with LIV. So, um, yeah, they got to step up. They got to get control of the situation. So that's where we are. This thing is far, far from resolved, and it's now kind of built to the front. Uh, And now it's become a real hot conversation piece. It is interesting. Rory McIlroy, who got there after winning the Scottish Open on Sunday, played really, really well. Scottish Open is kind of a tune-up, although not everybody plays in it. But now he's on a roll as he as he goes to Hoylake. He just says, I'm tired of talking about this. I can't solve it. Yeah. Uh, I expressed my opinions way back when this was first filtered out. So it'll be interesting to see... Well, and Jay Monahan, of course, is coming off sick leave. He is he is there now. What Monahan has to say, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, go into the first round on Thursday. But it is a great tournament. Holy cow! If you get excited about watching Wimbledon tennis, I know golf fans that just go crazy watching this. It's such a neat global event, and it's so wrapped around the history. Oh yeah, of the guy who founded it, the old. Tom Moore mm. back in the 1820s. So bring on <laughs> golf Thursday, but we haven't obviously solved the issues. Okay, John, fans forum, your turn. Those guys are standing in line out there in left field where it's 101 degrees today on a Monday. Where do you want to start? Okay, so let's go here to Tim. And he says, time to sell, A.J. Preller. Well, if if this thing becomes 12 games back or 15 games back, because as John and I talked about last weekend, uh, you know, this this 10-game roadie is tough. And when they come home, aren't very many cream puffs to be played. They come home, yeah, they get the Pirates, who are dead in the water now. But they get first place Texas. And then they get near first place Baltimore. And then they got to go play the Dodgers four in a row. Granted, they do get seven with Arizona, which is wilting in the heat of the pennant race and they, the heat on the pavement in downtown Phoenix. But if they're 12-15 back... What do you do? Are you a seller? Do you move Soto? Do you move Hater? What kind of message does it send to the people? They're averaging 40,000 plus per game who bought all those season tickets. It's just selling it out. You think these people are going to come back? Mm. Tough call. It is a tough call, but I think the right move now is to sell. It's just to accept reality because we keep thinking we live in a different reality where the Padres are good, like we thought they would be in the beginning of the year. But this is just such a disaster. And in Kevin Acey's column in the UT, he was commenting about how after that game on Sunday, Manny Machado just looked spent. He looked exhausted, you know, because they're trying so hard to fix it and nothing's working. So I wonder if you just have to accept that reality, trade off Snell, Hater, maybe Soto, and then kind of regroup for next year. Yeah, but you're not going to regroup with the same team and the same potential because if you're trading established major leaguers, and Soto's played much better the last couple of months than he did the first two. 
I just don't know. They gave up five top prospects, including Mackenzie Gore to get Soto. I don't know that you can get five prospects by putting Soto there. And if you do, you're creating a huge hole in your batting order and in left field. And who the hell's going to be your closer? Don't tell me Robert Suarez. You've got to make sure he can pitch an inning <laughs> right. without having a flare-up in his elbow. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's just a really complex mosaic now that they have to navigate through. Um, Isn't it amazing, though, that at the beginning of the year, we were so optimistic. We said, oh, this lineup is deep, you know, and they're going to have to pitch to the guys 7th and 8th and ninth in line. They're going to get strikes to hit. And, oh, my God, the starting five looks great. We had too many starters. Those guys are going to be great relievers. We've got Suarez and Hayter on the back end. We have too many resources. We have too much talent. How are we going to fit them all on the roster? And now look where we are now. It's just like it doesn't make sense. No, it's the word of the day on Sesame Street is fanatics. <laughs> Fans are fanatics. That's right. We all bought it. We all believed it based on paper. We all thought it hasn't worked that way. Okay, he says sell off. Next question. Okay, here's uh, one from SG Sports Channel. And he says, I'm real excited about the 49ers preseason football, which, which starts in just three weeks. Well, we're going to start doing more and more NFL stuff pretty quickly here on our Thursday and podcast, our Monday bonus packages, because camps are opening within the next week. I mean, I think San Francisco is loaded. They are loaded at wide receiver. They're obviously got the greatness of Christian McCaffrey. Phenomenal offensive line. Rugged. Take no prisoner defense up front. And the burning question, obviously, is is can they keep the quarterback on the field? And who is going to win the starting quarterback job? But we'll talk more NFL football as we go forward. San Francisco's elite in the NFC. But then again, the AFC's got Kansas City and the Super Bowl trophy and all that. It'll be fun, but we'll we'll deal a lot more NFL going forward. Yeah, I think we're getting anxious to see how that whole quarterback situation works out with the 49ers. But people are hungry for NFL content. We posted that that vertical video about John Gruden. You want to burn down the NFL. Boy, that lit up Instagram. So the, the fans are hungry for NFL content. Be here Thursday, be here Monday. We will talk more NFL football as we march on, John. Okay, a lots more Padres comments here from the fans. Here's one from John Hopkins. Hate to say it, but it's time to sell for the Padres. Get some chemistry guys and not necessarily guys who tell you to check their baseball <laughs> card stats. Yeah, and guys who look at their teammates and, I got my money, did you get yours? Yeah. I, I, that's a terrible thing to say, but it's so weird. This team just does not fit together. This team does yeah. not seem to have, quote, lineup chemistry that makes things happen. You know, you sat there and you watched that game with the Phillies, and I, you know, I've told you, I look at the Padre batting order and it'd scare the crap out of me if I put a guy on base and all of a sudden, here comes the Fab Four. You got to pitch these guys. But the Padres don't produce. What Philadelphia do? Holy cow, every time Bryce Harper came to the plate, you feared he was going to launch it. Yeah, and he did. Yeah, and every <laughs> time that left fielder came to the plate, you knew he would launch it because he launched a bunch of them in that game. Oh, yeah. So... I, there's something missing. It's just weird. You look at Philadelphia's batting order, and they can hurt you, and they do hurt you. And the Padres, with rare exception, don't hurt you. And again, I'm going crazy. Throw cold water on me if you need to. But how can you be 0-9 in extra innings, where every extra inning starts with a ghost runner at second base, and you got the Fab Four at the top of the order, and you can't drive home that ghost runner and win a game in extra? How is that humanly possible no more conversation from me. Yeah, it makes none of this makes sense. But Manny Machado insisted that there's no bad chemistry, that they all get along and they're friends. But, you're, you know, you're doubting that. You kind of rolled your eyes. Do you think maybe that there's something going on? Well, I think we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I think there's problems dug out, Bob Melvin, to upstairs, the analytic guys. I think there's a huge problem there. But the chemistry has to come from players, too. You know, look at the exciting 15 minutes we had with the Sombrero Sluggers and how cool that was. Think about last year yeah. in the drive to the playoffs, how that dugout ignited and there was a special chemistry there. You can wear your swag chain. Maybe that's going <laughs> to st- change things. But it, to me, it's missing. It's MIA. I just, I just don't understand it. Okay, we got a couple more here. Guys really want to vent. Uh, Here's Manny. He says, can the Padres really afford more payroll with their current TV deal? I think that's a big issue. We've talked about it extensively. Nobody's written about it. 
We talked about it extensively when they lost the $60 million payday from Bally Sports, Diamond Sports, etc. I just don't think they make up that money going forward. Now, I have no doubt the gross revenue of the Padres, that what they're getting because of what they're charging, ticket-wise, food-wise, jerseys, hoodies, etc., they're going to have volume revenue coming in the front door this year. But they don't have $60 million as the anchor to pay the big money contracts. I'd be concerned just about that as to what the structure of their finances are going to be. You know, if this turns out to be a crap season, if they don't make the playoffs, you think 24,000 season ticket holders are going to renew yeah, no way. at increased prices? You know, lost in all the conversation. Nobody's written about this. They raised their ticket prices a combined 38% the last two years. 18% one year, 20% the next year with the premise and the idea, we're going to sign players and we're going to win. Well, they signed them. They charged you money for it, and they haven't won yet. It's a tough disappointment. Holy cow. Well, I think they're going to get some replacement revenue for the Lost Bally's deal, but they're not going to get the full $60 million yep. a year. Um, but, yeah, to your point, you wonder about the season ticket renewals because how many sellouts have they had this year? It's been like 20-something. Oh, it's right? record-setting. Yeah, and imagine how disappointed those folks are. And, you know, when you roll in a family of four, you know, you're dropping a big chunk of change. Um, so it's just been so difficult. I mean, thank goodness Petco is still a fun place to go. Yep. And there's all that energy and electricity, even if the team comes up short. But that can only last so long. Concur. We got a couple more here. Want to fire us questions? Okay. Here's another one. Uh, again, people just venting about the Padres. From Emmanuel, he says, Padres need to trade Soto and Hater. At this point, the season is over, especially if the Diamondbacks and Dodgers land their trade targets. All right. Here's what I'll tell you. Later tonight... Because I'm in the process of writing a column on my website, my one man's opinion column, about what I think the Padres must do, simultaneously what I think the Dodgers will do, and then thirdly what I think the Angels are going to do. If you like baseball, and it's obvious by the fact that people have just overwhelmed us on fans' forum with baseball questions, go to my website later tonight. I post it in the, later in the evening. It'll be there tonight, probably by 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. It'll be there tomorrow morning. Go to leehacksawhamilton.com. You can always respond on my email. I have an email link that goes from my website to John's house, back to my house, <laughs> into my email address. You can always respond. But read my, my columns are extensive, and they're really, really unique and different. As witnessed by the response I got this past week, when I wrote about the death of newspapers. And that'll be another topic on the table we're going to do a roundtable yeah. discussion on. But um, you trade Soto, you trade Hater, giving up on the season, bad message to the organization. And is that not an indictment of the general manager and his methodology? Yeah. Big issue. Well, it seems like Peter Seidler really likes A.J. Preller. Yep. OK, but how long is that going to continue? Especially Call them excellence hasn't won bleep with the exception of one series against the Dodgers last October. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this this is a really tough spot. But I think, yeah, the Padres are going to have to make some adjustments. I do want to comment about the wet your website and all the writing, because we think of you as the voice of the Chargers. You know, we think of you as the voice of mighty 690 and 1090. We don't really think of you as a writer, but your writing is actually very good. I tend to think so. Yeah. I mean, you do a really good job with that. And I can see how the way you work, because you, you really gather your thoughts and you're able to put together a nice column. And then a lot of that content comes out here in the podcast. You are right. I am bleeping brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's move on. A couple more on fans form. Yeah, this is you talked about lineup chemistry with the Padres. So let's get Tom's question involved. He says, I'm relatively new to the baseball world. Since Soto's OPS is almost 900, actually, I think it's more than that. Why have they never placed him first at bat? Well, because he's a power bat, in addition to be a guy that gets a ton of walk. Um, you know, OPS is on base percentage, whether that's singles or bases on balls, coupled with slugging percentage. And if you want Soto there to produce to his max effort, you would probably push him back in the lineup with the hope you're going to get guys in front of him on base, and then he goes yard and drives home two or three runs. 
didn't have, surely didn't happen at the beginning of the season. Holy cow, what a mechanical mess he was! <laughs> has gotten progressively better. He's hitting balls on on frozen ropes now and line drives, home runs, etc. So he's he's kind of in sync for the most part. But that's that's a quick answer as to why you don't bat him lead off because yeah, he does get on base, but you'd rather have him hitting home runs with Tatis and somebody else in front of him on base. Well, I think the other part of the story is is that he was so I've heard through the grapevine that he was kind of pissy about batting one or even two cuz he wants to be a 3 or a 4 guy cuz he wants to get the ribbies so he can have a bigger numbers and and make a bigger deal when his contract is up. Yeah, exactly. It's all everything is interrelated here. The bottom line is dollar bills. Okay, let's go to some of the social media comments cuz there are a ton of these as well. And uh let's talk about the Clippers. I think this is a good one. Uh this is from uh Rafi on uh, Instagram. He said, I would pull a 360 and get rid of both of them. He's talking about Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. If I sign them, I'm trying to trade them somewhere else. Both are damaged goods, and you would have to be a goofball GM to sign both on the wrong side of 30 for 40 or more years. And before you respond, I just want to say, doing a 360 is one of those things that people say it the wrong way. It's a 180 (laughs) if you want to turn around. Whirly Bird. Okay. Uh, He's making reference to what we talked about last week about the Clippers and what they are going to do. Uh, This Wednesday, the NBA window opens in which teams can negotiate max contracts with their stars. And Kawhi Leonard, Paul George headed into the final year of their contract. Uh, The max contract they could get would be four years, $220 million. Those are two phenomenal players. But those are two players that have had a lot of injuries in the last three years. I went back and counted 308 games the Clippers have played over four the last four seasons, 308. Mm-hmm. Those guys have missed 266 games combined. Oh my Kawhi's God. had three surgeries on his right knee. Uh, he's just underwent another one on the offseason for cleanup of the knee. Before that, it was a torn ligament. Before that, it was the devastating quad injury. He's breaking down. Paul George has had three different injuries, all of them fluke, torn elbow, ligament when a guy ran into him, a knee injury, back injury, hip injury. Uh, I think between them, they've had seven different injuries in L.A. in the last couple of years. So the burning question for the Clippers organization, you like these guys, you traded for these guys, you think these guys could get you to the championship level, but they can't stay on the floor. Now, are you going to max them four years, 220 going forward after the season? phenomenal amount of money. I don't know that I would do it. They owe you another year. If they go out and if they get hurt again, their value goes down and maybe you sign them for a different extension. I just, from a business standpoint, as great an owner as Steve Ballmer is, and by the way, in his spare time, he's building a new arena Mm -hmm. near the old Great Western Forum. As good an owner as he is, you got to have some common sense here about the economics. I would not max offer anybody, or those two guys, at this point. I want to see what the season's like. Because you have a window. It, start, it opens Wednesday, but it goes into next season. You can offer the max anywhere. And the NBA rules are structured. You get bigger money in-house as a max guy than if they would become free agents and go outside the dollar value to go to a different team is less than the max contract offer. So that's what I would do. Uh, I wouldn't offer them right now. I'd talk, express interest, but say, we got a season to play. I want to see how the season plays out. Yeah, this is a tough call for Steve Ballmer. Um, but, you know, when we do those verticals and I, I kind of put the videos together, I went looking for some video clips of Kawhi and Paul George on the court at the same time. Few and far between. I, I couldn't find any at Giphy.com. So it just tells you that they're not together. And so, again, it's like the Padre situation. You just have to accept reality. And the reality is, is those two guys are hurt all the time and it's not working. So you've got to make some changes. So I think you've got to pick one or the other. I mean, which one do you, would you want to keep and which one would you send away? I don't think that at this point in time, Kawhi's got much trade value pg might paul george has been shopped teams have expressed interest there was rumor going into the draft paul george miami paul george new york knicks deal has not come but then the question do you get fair value for a guy it's a walk free agent with an injury history attached to his resume is he of more value to you one good year with him and Kawhi if they can both stay healthy maybe you're a championship round team 
If you're trading them, you're probably not. And you're getting equal value by trading them at this point in time. Tough, tough call. Yeah, it's a tough one here. We've got some more social media comments. Let's get some other people involved. Oh, yeah, this is the whole John Gruden thing was lighting up over the last few days. And this is from DM Anderson. He says, Goodell is an A-hat. I hope Gruden destroys him. There are a lot of people on social media that are in Camp Gruden on this whole deal. Well, I think it's the end thing in the world is to bury the commissioner. I don't care whether your name is Roger Goodell or it was David Stern or Adam Silver or Gary Bettman or Rob Manfred. All those guys take a lot of abuse. I'm not sure it's all fair, but that's the that's the perspective that fans who pay the price tag have on these guys. Um, somebody leaked these emails. Now, I don't know whether it was Daniel Snyder, whether it was Goodell, whether it was the union chief who was slurred by John Gruden, Demora Smith. Somebody leaked these, and it was intentional. They didn't just get out. But I guess the the factor I don't understand, why would the league, with the reputation that they have, the shield as they call it, (laughs) the amount of money that they are making, the most successful business in the world, why would they ever risk doing something like that? I don't care whether you like Gruden or not. You can expel Gruden from the league. Look what he did. Look what he wrote in those emails. And what bothers me is as dynamic as an X and O's guy as Gruden can be, and as fiery as he can be, as good as a TV analyst, fun guy to listen to, he wrote junk that was really distasteful. And that, to me, meant it was in his heart. Mm-hmm. And what does it say about the person when they write that stuff? I may be bleeping brilliant as a talk show host, <laughs> but if I write a bunch of bad tweets or I write well, yeah. venomous columns that are fabricated or I- irresponsible, mm-hmm. what kind of person am I? He wrote junk that I firmly believe was in his heart. And that's that's what really disappoints me because he was a pretty popular guy. Well, do you think it's just like Raider Nation and we're nihilists? We just want to burn the whole thing down. They just want to see death and destruction and roadkill on the side of the road. I mean, it's pretty crazy. I mean, because you can't defend what Gruden said. Yeah, you sure you might have a beef with Goodell, but I don't know how in the heck you could be on Team Gruden on this thing. So I, I concur with you. Let's move on. Next question. Okay, so let's go here and talk about the Oakland situation. This is from Togo and Moss about the A's maybe playing in San Francisco. He says, Oakland did not support the team when they were winning. Look back 20 years. They have never been higher than number 19 in attendance and usually number 26 or lower. It's not a sports city anymore. Losing all four major sports would be all the proof anybody needs. Fisher will probably sell, but would be crazy to before the team triples in value in Las Vegas. Well, I think the big issue here is Oakland is economically disadvantaged. I think it's it's a dying city. Uh, it's been passed, obviously, in industry. It's been passed by Silicon Valley. It's It's been totally set aside by the growth of downtown San Francisco. And the athletics have been plagued by really bad ownership. I'll give you a quick history lesson. They were owned by a great baseball man, Connie Mack, when they were the Philadelphia Athletics. Mm-hmm. And he did not have money. And they played at Old Scheib Park. And he sold off his stars twice, Jimmy Fox and other great Hall of Famers. And they moved to Kansas City. And they weren't well financed in Kansas City. And they became the joke when baseball was they became a farm club for the New York Yankees. Because every time there was a good prospect in Kansas City, he wound up at Yankee Stadium. You've heard the name Roger Maris, have you not? Oh, yeah. Okay. Charlie Finley bought them. He moved them to Oakland. And they built through the farm system. And as strange a guy as Charlie O was, he had good baseball people. And they got to the World Series. And they had Reggie Jackson. And they had Sal Bando and Joe Rudy. I mean, thought you were there. You yeah. know. You were yeah, screaming. Campy Campaneras. That's and, right. Oh, yeah. But – at the end of the day, he decided, I'm getting rid of these players. I'm not going to pay these players this kind of money. Now, he he got into war with Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner, mm-hmm. and the commissioner blocked him multiple, multiple times, and Charlie finally gave up the fight and sold the franchise. Uh, and then they've gone through all these different small money owners, and, and now you got John Fisher. It's just a, it's a horrific situation, and the market has decayed around them. And, you know, the inner city of Oakland is terrible. The educational system in Oakland is terrible. Um it's just a bad, bad marketplace. 
at this point in time. Could they have flourished if they had been allowed to move to San Jose and build a stadium or move to the Silicon Valley or move to Sacramento? Now, the Giants blocked them under the territorial rules. So that's that's why that stuff did not happen. But I don't, I don't think there's any way out. They're going to go to Las Vegas. But the, I guess the burning question, is this a good owner? Is John Fisher a good owner? Is he strictly a an entrepreneur profiteer who owns a franchise and gets all this revenue sharing money, et cetera. So, but that's, that's three years down the road. So there's going to be some misery, still misery. I feel so bad for Mark Kotze. I, you and I talked about this mm-hmm. before. He's a manager of a team that's 20, 25 and 70 right now and just no hope Ooh. at all. That's brutal. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, just looking at the social media comments, the fans are really angry with Fisher. Everyone's upset with mm-hmm. this guy. But how long has Oakland Coliseum has had those tarps on the upper deck, like all the way around? Well, that was built for Al Davis and the Raiders, and then Al Davis left, and the Oakland A's were playing baseball in a badly designed football stadium. Uh, and then the product wasn't very good, and it just— it's just everything that was a, could happen as a negative happened as a negative uh, in the Bay Area. And it's too bad. I mean, if you go back and watch the movie Moneyball, you think about all the great players that played in Oakland for a chunk of time. And then Billy Bean tried to reinvent it mm-hmm. and had some success but never got to the World Series. Okay, let's do one or two more here on Fans Forum. Okay, let's talk about Coach Prime. Um, this is from Pretty Boomer. It says, uh, gentlemen, uh, Coach Prime stated in previous videos that this was partially due to an old NFL injury to his toes and he had been dealing with the pain for years. The blood clots were discovered while he was coaching at Jackson State, after which he learned from his mom that a few of the older family members had previously dealt with the same. I hope that helps with some of the questions. He even partially addressed it in his interview with Shannon Sharp. Nice podcast. I respect how nicely you address the health issue is not every host does so in a classy and respectful way. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I did not know extensively about family issues, whether it's diabetes or blood clots. Um, you know, I, there, there was a scare here for about three weeks where there was actual thought that they might have to amputate his leg just because the blood clots were so bad. Uh, and they've amputated a couple of toes already. I think there's still a fear that there may have to be more. I think he's accepted his his life circumstances. Um, so we'll get him healthy. He'll get to camp in August. And he has functioned. He functioned very well despite being, quote, in recovery from surgeries while he was at Jackson State. But I know they're so excited in Boulder and they're sold out Folsom Field and they're so amped. It's such a new team, such a different team. I think it's going to be a hard season because I think when you make as many changes, you know, 62 out of 72 players are new to the program. It just it just takes time to build it. And even though he reaped what he thought as a bonanza, of guys in the transfer portal. There's a lot of people in college football that are pissed off that he used the transfer portal to dump all those bodies out in the street. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of team he puts on the field and how he copes with it if it if it turns out to be a 2-10 and ten football team. Well, I think it might be the first year or two, uh, but I'm rooting for him. Um, I, I, I think the world of him, and I think what he accomplished at Jackson State and just the whole energy he brings. And yeah, he used that transfer portal and blew out a ton of guys, but... They only won what they won one game last year. I mean, they had to make radical changes. Can we fit a few more questions in? Two, two more, two more. Okay, here's a good. There's a soccer comment from Makatu, and he says, "Above all, Christian Pulisic hates hates to miss Champions League. Everyone on that Chelsea team was wise to get out of the dumpster fire. They bled a lot of players in this off season. I just don't know what Chelsea's ownership, which is led by an American, Todd Bowley, minority owner in the Dodgers." I don't understand what what their business model is going forward unless they're letting the coach dictate all the player personnel moves. But, you know, Pulisic's stay in Chelsea was as a young player learning on the job, which is really hard because that's the most elite soccer league there is in the world. And then he had a lot of nagging injuries. So we'll see what it's like when he goes to AC Milan. We're biased because he wears the red, white, and blue. Mm -hmm. We're biased because we have seen an 18-year-old grow into a leader and a man at age 24. He's produced here for our USA World Cup team, but obviously he's not produced with any consistency because he wasn't in the lineup on the field with any consistency, and he was hurt a bunch 
which impacted his consistency playing for Chelsea. So we'll see where it goes. You know, 2026, damn, can't get here quick enough for me as it relates to U.S. World Cup soccer. And by the way, a side comment, Thursday, Women's U.S. Nice. World Cup starts in Australia and in New Zealand. And Team USA plays, I think it's Vietnam. Uh, this will be the, the, the final go-round for Megan Rapino, And obviously you got Alex Morgan and all the newcomers who have talks of Women's World Cup. I think, I think it's aired here Friday. It's actually Saturday down under. But the game will be aired here Friday on Fox. I'm so excited to see that. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun to watch. But imagine Pulisic, go back to him for a minute. Let's say he's on AC Milan and they win their league and they go to the Champions Cup uh, and he his team ends up beating some of the uh, Premier Leagues from, from Britain. Wouldn't that be great? Oh. Well, he's got to score a pile of goals for that to happen. But yeah. uh, it is interesting. There's so many players that have moved this summer. The big money in in the English Premier League has, has just changed everything. There are so many quality guys. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Harry Kane, the, who's mm-hmm. a great goal scorer, record-setting goal scorer for Tottenham Hotspur, another elite team in the English Premier League. Harry Kane is now in the middle of a bidding war between Bayern Munich and suddenly Paris Saint-Germain in France has stepped up and put a wad of cash on the table. And there's been so much player movement. Uh, EPL guys to Saudi Arabia, EPL guys going to other EPL teams being stolen in free agency. So English Premier League is kind of like baseball free agency now in the NFL draft. Boy, they are moving. Yeah, and I think there's been messy sightings in grocery stores in Florida. Yes. So <laughs> yeah, let's get this one more question in. And this is, uh, I mean, we were talking about maybe the possibility of a daily dose of Hacksaw. And uh, Bryce Dixon says, do it, Hacksaw. I called your show as a nine-year-old and talked about the Bruce Hurst trade with you. Uh, we got so many people I cross paths with. I can't go anywhere in the community. And it's great. I can't go anywhere without people stopping me and wanting to do a talk show. Oh, yeah. And it's, you know. My two surgeons are both longtime listeners and podcast freaks, and they're texting me and messaging me all the time. We're talking about it. I don't know where this conversation is going to go. I'm sorry with apologies. You have to be paid to do stuff. I don't want to do stuff for free. So we'll just we'll see where it goes. But full disclosure, I'm I'm just going to say this because I don't talk about my personal life. John knows about it because he and I text all the time as best friends. Within the last calendar week, now I was I was away on a holiday at my cottage, and those of you who watch the podcast saw me do my thing from the Adirondacks in upstate New York near the, the Canadian border. In one week's time, hotel reservations canceled, two flights home canceled, came home, cataract surgery on my eye, came home, sprinkler system blew up, came <laughs> home. Air conditioning broke. Took me three days to get that fixed. Came home. Wife's car quit. Came home. Microwave blew up. (laughs) Oh, my God. All that within from last Saturday to where we are here the following Monday. Just unbelievable. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. But I showed up for work. I'm playing hurt. (laughs) I can't see straight. Mouth hurts. Oh, and I forgot to add. Root canal. That's coming next. Okay. All this week. So, ah, so, geez. Uh, that, yes, it was a crap week, but we're here talking sports. So, for him to say, you need to go back on the air every, every day. Yeah. I'll take that under advisement. I'll have my people call your people. Okay. Well, we got to get you like a $100 million contract, you know, like a lot of these ball players are getting to sign you up because the fans would love to hear you every day. But, you know, doing it as a podcast, that's, that's a full time gig. A lot of research. And by the way, check my website. You will like what I write. If you're a baseball fan, check my website later tonight, my one man's opinion column. Hey, we really enjoy doing this. We thank you for being part of our bonus podcast on Monday. Of course, we have a regular podcast on Thursday. Make sure you tell all your friends what's going on about our podcast. Subscribe. Don't be afraid to give us thumbs up. Give us five-star rating. It's great to have you with us every Monday and every Thursday. John, you better solve these Padre problems because somebody's going to get traded. Hell, you might get traded if this thing doesn't work out. <laughs> I'm uh, checking MLBTradeRumors.com <laughs> for the latest updates. Have yourself a great day. We'll talk to you come Thursday. Okay, looking forward to it. Thanks for being with us on Hacksaw's Headlines. Join us again for Hacksaw's Headlines on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And find the audio version on your favorite podcast app. Touchdown, San Diego! 
For more content, go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com.